<clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Edward. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here. Drizzle never kept people in Seattle away. And uh, there are a lot of friends here, a lot of supporters, people we've worked with over the years. Uh, but th this is a different kind of presentation. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not going to go into a huge rendition of all the things that are wrong uh, with this world of ours, uh, because I'm going to be animated by two uh, little statements uh, of ancient vintage. One was from Marcus Cicero over 2,000 years ago in ancient Rome when he defined freedom as participation in power. Notice he didn't just define freedom as from repression and harassment and all kinds of bad things of arbitrary power. He defined it positively as well. Freedom is participation in power. And the second uh, insight came from uh, 14th century China under the Ming Dynasty. One, one of their f famous philosophers said, to know and not to do is not to know. To know and not to do is not to know. That is particularly appropriate for millions of Americans who see things that are not right, who see the drift of our country here and abroad heading toward serious complications and tragedies for our descendants, if not for ourselves, uh, and who display great concern. But that concern is often not translated into action. And in this context, civic engagement. That's the difference between someone who is just concerned but someone who believes that to know and not to do is not to know. Now I'm going to just start with three little stories because before we get civic engagement, we have to have a, a civic personality. Uh, you, you, you can't just say something is terribly wrong and you go into temper tantrums because you're so worried about it. You lose your studiousness, you lose your temperamental equanimity. Uh, and you lose a lot of the assets that you would have otherwise. So three quick stories. Isaac Newton, uh, way back when in England, the famous physicist, uh, was at a gathering. And someone came up to him and said, Mr. Uh, Newton, why are you so much more brilliant than the other scientists? And he looked at the person and he said, I'm not so much more brilliant than the other scientists. But perhaps I can hold on to a problem in my mind and concentrate on it longer than most of them. Pull out the word concentration, concentration. Now we move to William Blake, who is a famous artist and poet uh, in England over a couple centuries ago. And he was at some get together and someone came up to him and said, Mr. Blake, with whom are you living now? And Blake looked at the person and said, with whom am I living? I'm living with my imagination. So pull out the word imagination. The third was a statement, uh, very modest, by Albert Einstein, uh, but he was making a point. He said, quote, I have no special attributes. I have no special uh, assets. I just have a passionate curiosity. And pull out the word curiosity. So we have concentration, imagination, curiosity. We're all able uh, to reflect those traits and put content into them. And that really is sort of the infrastructure that we fill with the, the facts, uh, the data, the statistics, the trends, the tragic results or the beneficial uh, results. And before I lose a reference to history, let me just share with you a story about Eugene Debs, the great leader of working people from about 1890 to 1925 in America. And he is the kind of person, he took a train from Philadelphia to speak to an audience in the open fields in Chicago and 150,000 people showed up. So he's pretty well known. 
he was opposed to World War I, and Woodrow Wilson had his attorney general prosecute him and throw him in jail. And in jail in 1920, he got a million votes for president. He, he ran for president several times. I can share his experience. <laughs> the, the, the interesting tidbit here is that near the end of his career, which was about 1925, he was really pretty exhausted. Uh, he was asked by a reporter, Mr. Debs, what's your greatest regret? You've been fighting for the working person all these decades. What's your greatest regret? And he said, my greatest regret? He said, my greatest regret is that the American people, under their constitution, can have almost anything they want, but it just seems that, like they don't want much of anything at all. That, that goes to the expectation level. The grimmest and most effective controlling process by the few over the many is not outright brutality. It's lowering or keeping expectation levels so, so minimal that the very imagination or sp uh, uh, the very view that things could be different doesn't cross their mind. That was the status, say, of slavery, or the status of the, of the serf in the middle, medieval periods. So with that background, let's start with what there is a major uh, public opinion behind in this country. And a lot of these are left-right support. One of the biggest divide and rule tactics that's going on in this country is that constant drumbeat every day. We are a highly polarized society, uh, we are blue state, we are red state, we are conservative, be, we are liberal, and we just can't get together. That may be true in reproductive rights, school player, prayer, gun control, and some other issues, but there are a huge number of transformational issues that there is heavy left-right support behind. Right here in Washington state, you're gonna have an initiative to take the minimum wage to $13.50 outside of Seattle where it's going to 15. There is heavy left-right support. In fact, there's almost no overt opposition to this on the television, I'm told, and it's gonna win with the super majority. Throughout the country, it comes in in the polls 75 to 80% in terms of a significant restoration of the minimum wage adjusted for inflation, which would be $11 plus additional increase to reflect a tiny bit of the worker productivity increase uh, since 1968. But there's more. There's left-right support to preserve and defend our civil liberties even when we're attacked, like 9-11. Not to give up our liberty for security. As Benjamin Franklin once said, those who prefer security over liberty deserve neither. And there's strong left-right support against those provisions in the Patriot Act that allow the government to, to search your home and not tell you for 72 hours, to get into your medical financial library records without probable cause, which is the key in the Fourth Amendment. And there's very strong support for that. The bloated military budget, you wouldn't think so, but you, you, go, you go to the various uh, concentrations of opinion on this, and while conservatives may like a bigger budget than some progressives, none of them like the bloated, inflated, corrupt, redundant military budget that isn't even auditable. It's the only department in the United States government that cannot produce data to the Government Accountability Office of the U.S. Congress to get audited. And it's violating federal law since 1992. You'll get a good left-right. That was illustrated by Congressman Ron Paul and Congressman Barney Frank, right, left in Congress. They developed a caucus to reduce the bloat in the military budget. There are others as well. Cracking down on corporate crime. There's all kinds of corporate crime against consumers, against homeowners. Remember the robo uh, signatures and the whole mess with uh, the derivatives and uh, and uh, phony mortgages and overextension of credit, et cetera, and foreclosures. There's corporate crime against workers, occupational 
disease hazards, uh, not paying overtime, so forth. There's corporate crime against uh, the environment. We know that in many ways. These are all reported. The interesting thing here is that there's so little done about corporate crime that even major media that, res that rely on corporate advertising think nothing of reporting it because they know that nothing's done about it anyway. So why would the advertisers be that upset? And you see it with the Wells Fargo situation. And you see it with insurance scams. You see it now with scamming, where their computerized systems allow sellers to sell you things you never knew about and never wanted, but they appeared on the bill. And if you started messing around and complaining, they say, well, watch out for your credit score, your credit rating. Uh, there's corporate crime against the government. $60 billion is the estimate looted from Medicare by the vendors around the country. $60 billion, and they recover about $5 billion a year because the same lobbyists make sure that the enforcement budgets against corporate crime are minuscule. There aren't enough federal cops on the corporate crime beat. And then there's the criminogenic crimes. The, these are technically not crimes because the corporations excluded this kind of behavior uh, when Congress was contemplating uh, statutory law. So they are not technically crimes, but they fit the common law of a crime. Premeditated behavior resulting in the loss of innocent life or the loss of property, uh, and somehow it never was protected by a criminal statute. But what do you call, for example, what's going on now in military policy and foreign policy, uh, where you have private contractors uh, shooting up people, uh, doing things that only the military was supposed to do, encroaching on public functions such as military activity, and increasingly doing more and more of what corporations were never permitted to do and doing it under a kind of protective immunity because they're under sort of de Department of Defense contracts. And you've read stories about what's happened in Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and, and the like. I uh, graduated from Harvard Law School, and I just wrote a column recently, and I said Harvard Law School should split its, split its curriculum into two. One is Harvard Law School, and they study statutes, judicial decisions, they tweak them here and there, and have good discussions with their uh, professors. And the other curriculum is Harvard Lawless School. <laughs> the mass of lawlessness for, uh, in the plutocracy and the oligarchy is institutionalized. The presidency now, regardless of who's there, is above the law in very, very major respects. Right now, it is presidential doctrine that a president can, can kill anybody in the world who the president thinks is a suspect, never mind imminent, imminent danger, just is a suspect, doesn't like us, would like us to get out of their backyard and, and become, as president, in secret, vaporizing them with drones, push button Nevada and, and Virginia, become the executioner, become the Prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner, all in secret. And they can vaporize seven or eight young men in Yemen standing there. They don't even know their names. But the algorithmic models say, these fit the age group and their gestures and so on, push the button, and they're gone. This is organized murder. Now, all wars are murder, but they're supposed to be legal under international law. If you're attacked, you can fight back, and a lot of people die. But this is now completely out of control, and it's bipartisan. And it's partly, partly out of control because Congress has surrendered its constitutional duty to declare war, and if it doesn't, the presidency cannot go to war, cannot engage in military attacks, unless there's imminent threat. And imminent threat is not defined very rigorously these days. It almost is defined by oratory that's hostile to the United States. So there is a lot of left-right support 
Criminal justice reform. 15 legislatures have passed juvenile justice reform because liberals, conservative lawmakers got together. Solar energy, big, big left-right support. If they had to choose with solar energy or fossil fuel, nuclear, hands down, it's solar. It doesn't matter whether it's, it doesn't matter if it's liberal or conservative. The Koch brothers are putting money in state legislatures in the South to get a sales tax on solar panels. Guess what? They're losing because there's no such thing as a Republican solar panel or a Democrat solar panel. And this includes wind power, of course, and the various forms of renewable energy, the forthcoming geothermal and, and the like. Another one is standing to sue. There's a doctrine that says you as a citizen cannot sue the government uh, for raw corruption, for misuse of resources, for any kind of egregious effort because you're, you're considered not having enough of a stake to persist the lawsuit. That's coming out of medieval England, completely antiquated, but it's become a doctrine of judicial abdication and convenience so that you can't even get through the door and plead in court with the evidence. You can't even get through the door. No standing to sue. That comes in over 90% when you explain it. Binding none of the above so people can go and vote no confidence for those on the ballot. That comes in off the charts, left, right. That way, binding none of the above gets more votes than the other candidates on the ballot. It cancels that line, and you have new elections in, say, 30 days with new candidates. It's a way of registering no confidence in gerrymandered or other kinds of corrupt electoral practices. Breaking up the big New York banks that are too big to fail. George Will, conservative columnist, writes, several times, if these banks are too big to fail, they are too big to exist. Again, left-right support. In my book, Unstoppable, it's over there, the emerging left-right alliance to dismantle the corporate state, there are 24 areas of convergence. And the importance here is not only it fights the divide and rule strategies that are often unscrupulously uh, manipulative, but it produces a political movement that is unstoppable. I have seen members of the Senate and House receive delegations of left-right, like to stop the Breeder Reactor Program in 1983 in Tennessee. And when they see that delegation in the office is composed of liberals and conservatives, they turn pale. They don't know how to game it. They don't know how to manipulate it. So if we really want to get things done in this country, let's pick some of those major issues, and these are major issues, getting rid of crony capitalism or corporate welfare, left-right support. These are not mi minor issues. Then we can get things really done and overcome this, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, nothing can change, oh me, oh my, let's go look at the third rerun of Friends on TV or something. <laughs> so, the list goes on, but I, I hope I have made my point to get to my next point. Now, when you look at all these changes that need to be made, and this country is full of problems it doesn't deserve and full of solutions it doesn't apply that are on this shelf. Housing, public transit, energy, new kinds of tax codes, new kinds of financing for small business, et cetera. That when you ask, well, how do we get these? What's the one institution that we have to have a laser beam focus on to get it done? Because, you know, you've been parts of these rallies here in Seattle, anti-war rallies or, or climate change rallies or whatever, and we've all participated in these rallies. They're usually on weekends. They usually are very effervescent, and they charge people up. And Monday morning, there's cleanup, and all that energy goes into the ether because it is not laser being focused on what? The most powerful institution of Congress is Congress. 535 people. We know their names. It's not a faceless bureaucracy in the executive branch. We know their names. They want our vote. They don't want a primary challenge. 
They don't want strong citizen organization back in the district that nullifies no matter how much money they raise. Because money is not votes. Money is to get votes by TV advertisements and slogans and all the things that cater to a small number of voters whose minds are not made up. And 80% of the voters in this country are hereditary voters. They vote Republican or Democrat because their grandparents voted Republican, Democrat. And so that 20% is targeted on these ads relentlessly again and again. And if people do not make, uh, do not do their homework, they're very vulnerable to the various emotional and often grotesquely distorted appeals uh, regarding who's running against whom. The interesting thing, by the way, just as a sidelight, if you want to make sure uh, that you shift the balance of power with your senator and representative so they cannot ma manipulate you so easily, do not confront them with one issue. If you say to a senator, I'm pro-choice, or you say, I'm pro-life, and you don't say anything else, they know how to deal with you because they've taken the position. What if you come up with 15, 20 issues and you start saying things like, I want the Patriot Act revised. I want Taft-Hartley law repealed, uh, strict control against forming unions. Uh, I want consumer protection in the financial area in a way where I can join with other consumers and tip the balance against some of these banks and even negotiate directly with them. Anyway, you go into it. The more issues you put on the table, the more you control the dynamic and the less they control the dynamic. Just This is a side bit here. So if Congress is uh, the Kyber Pass, you remember the Kyber Pass in history class, when the invaders wanted to go into India uh, centuries and centuries ago, like from the Mongols or other invaders wanted to go to India. They didn't go over the Himalaya Mountains, did they? I mean, you think they were dumb enough to do that? They went to the Khyber Pass. That was the entry. Congress is the Khyber Pass. We're millions of people, as Warren Buffett said. How come we can't control 535 people? Because we haven't organized minimally to do so. And what's What's important about that is here's how minimal it is. Now, we all have hobbies, most of us, and there are all kinds of hobbies. Stamp collecting, some people collect cars, that's fairly expensive. Uh, coin collecting, they collect feathers, they collect dolls from Sicily, uh, they collect uh, all kinds of things. Or, you know, bird watchers. I'm in total awe of bird watchers, by the way the diligence <laughs> up at five in the marshes binoculars camera points tablets connect with everybody else I'm up to 24 I got 38 got to get up earlier <laughs> the energy's awesome I'm told there are five million serious bird watchers in the United States I don't count 100 serious Congress watchers I count political clubs, you know, they're trying to get elected. But citizen watchers to try to get the general interest going, full-time, paid. There isn't a hundred of them. That's shocking. Because if you come to think of it, what's at stake in terms of transforming this country and helping to transform the world by getting off their back or helping them in by becoming a humanitarian power, perhaps, not just military superpower, is a huge challenge for our generation and, and our loyalty to posterity. It's going to be hard to look at our grandchildren in the eye. When they're sitting on our lap and they're nine years old, they're becoming aware of what's happening to the world. And the climate change is hit. And the dispersal of dangerous Weaponry is hitting, and the global economy is on the precipice, and the speculative binge, binges of other people's money, like 
mutual funds and pension funds. That's the Wall Street practice. And this nine-year-old, you know, has some sort of sense that things are going really bad, fast. And looks at you and says, Grandma, Grandpa, what's going on? What were you all doing when this started? What is Grandma and Grandpa going to say? Well, little child, we were otherwise busy. Otherwise busy? What were you otherwise busy with? When it comes to your civic duties, that child is going to be saying, when it grows up. So let's look at it very practically. Never has there been more than 1% of the people engaged throughout American history, spread out among congressional districts, Never has been 1%, often much less than 1%, wanting a change opposed by powerful interests, but wanting a change that reflects what Abraham Lincoln called the public sentiment, namely public opinion. And the powerful interests lost. Corporate and commercial interests were against the abolition of slavery. Think cotton plantations. They said no. They were against women's right to vote. Women wanted to get rid of child labor in dungeon factories, among other things. They said no. They were against the farmers organizing in East Texas in 1886 for the great spread of the progressive movement to regulate bank interest rates and regulate railroad freight rates that were squeezing their livelihoods. The banks and the railroads said no. They were against the right of workers in the industrial areas to organize unions. And the corporations said no. They were against proposals for Social Security, Medicare, auto safety, environmental health. They said no. They were against regulating the deadly coal mines which have taken over 450,000 lives since 1890, disease and accidents, so-called. They said no. They said no to the abolition of child labor. Imagine that. They said no to progressive taxation, to the 40-hour week, to unemployment compensation. They said no. But they lost, eventually. Because a handful of people, here, there, and everywhere, zeroed in on Congress or their state legislatures, representing majority opinion, and broke their opposition. Now, I submit, we don't have to wait that long anymore. We have faster communications. We have cheap communications. And other advantages that our forebears didn't have. When those farmers organized in the populist movement in 1886 in East Texas, they signed up 200,000 farmers in six months, $1 dues each. That's $50 today. Dirt poor farmers, that was a lot of money. And they did it without motor vehicles, telephone, no email, no text message, nothing but their head, heart, and feet. They shame us. We should be ashamed, collectively, even though we may exempt ourselves because we're more active. Collectively, we should be ashamed. We're always preoccupied, aren't we? When you get called by, when you call someone to come out for a march or a town meeting or a courtroom where an issue's being adjudicated, and you call them to come out, you're not changing their mind. They agree with you on the issue. And they say, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Or they tell you, well, I may have time, but I don't want to get into this thing. I don't, I don't know Robert's rules, and they tell me to shut up, and sometimes they throw you out of the town meeting. And, 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 and also, I don't like bad language being used against me. I don't like to be slandered. And by the way, if I had the time and I knew the techniques and the tools of getting democracy underway, and, and I was not blistered by moonbeams, uh, 
It wouldn't change anything anyway. That's the ultimate cop-out. The big boys are going to do it anyway. Boeing is going to exempt itself from Washington state taxation anyway. Paul Allen's going to make you pay for a, a, base, or a, a stadium anyway. So why try? Why, why, why lose time? You've got better things to do. Well, let's put down the figures. Ten per, there are two and a half million adults. Uh, excuse me. There are 220, 225 million adults in this country. Now you take not 10% of them, not 1% of them, just take 2,500 of them in each congressional district. No big deal. They could represent teachers, mechanics, neighborhood organizers, lawyers, business people, you know, nice spread. 2,500 decide they are going to have a Congress watchdog club. And it's going to revolve around an agenda of 12 transformational cha changes that reflect majority opinion, as I Gave some examples. Long overdue. Some of them have been established in Western Europe for over 50 years. Over 50 years ago in Western Europe, tuition-free higher education for all. A higher minimum wage for all. Easier rules to form stronger labor unions than we have for all. Better public transit better public works. Four to seven weeks paid vacation. Paid maternity leave, paid child care, paid family sick leave. Full insurance. Nobody dies in Western Europe because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. 35,000 Americans die every year because they can't afford health insurance or they're pushed out of it with all these little trap doors to get treated in time. That's coming off a Harvard Medical School peer-reviewed study that had it at 45,000 before Obamacare. What did they know we didn't know? They were destroyed after World War II. We were king. One number one power. What they knew was that they had multiple party systems, not a two-party duopoly. They had powerful cooperatives. They had powerful trade unions. They resurrected them after World War II. And they had higher expectation levels. They believed they should get something for their taxes other than military hardware, other than corporate welfare. We don't believe that. We want lower taxes instead of saying, what are we getting for our taxes? Half of the federal government's operating budget, just think of this, there's no more Soviet Union. Half of the federal government operating budget is military. That doesn't even count the VA. So here we are. You get 2,500 people. You can start with 100. Letterhead. You know, 5th District, Washington State, you know, Congress Watchdog Group. And you send a letter announcing your existence to your two senators and representatives. And you say, stay tuned. We're going to get bigger. And just as you can do your homework ahead of time, here's the 12 transformational agenda. We want you to pass. Enough is enough. You've been delaying. You're gridlocked. You worked 125 days a year, we pay you full time, you spend an average of 20 hours a week going from your office on Capitol Hill to an office building to raise funds because it's illegal to dial in your office. You should be on the job. They get this letter, then what's going on here? It's a bit of sophistication. And you tell them we got law professors and lawyers, we got community colleges and colleges. We got a lot of brain trust here. We'll be sending you the draft legislation in due time. 
Then you go to 500. You get a little press. You get an email. You get a blog. You go to 1,000. You go to 2,500, and this is what triggers. What triggers is that you all agree to volunteer about two to 300 hours a year each behind this effort, and to raise two to three hundred dollars each, to open two offices in every congressional district, two full-time people. And then you connect with it all over the country, 435 districts. Now, I'm leaving out a lot of mechanics here because we don't have the time, but is that undoable, for heaven's sake? There are people who spend more money and more time on their hobbies, and we can't spend that kind of effort on the great work of humanity on Earth, which is a pursuit of justice without which there's no freedom and no liberty. For our posterity, if not for us, for the future of this tortured planet and the people who are so much less able to live the good life than we are all over the world and the children that are in their midst, horrifically mistreated and deprived. Another way to do it is say, isn't there some mega billionaire here in Washington State who's, who's, who's bored? Huh? They're in their 70s, 80s. I mean, how many five-star five restaurant meals can you have with a little bib, you know, and the lobsters? Huh? And uh, you got grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren. You want to have some fun? The joy of justice. Nothing can match it. All right, so. Or if you want to take a piece of it. How about this? The, the defense budget, as I mentioned, is unauditable. For $2 million, I can guarantee in 36 months, that budget would be auditable. Anybody want? to raise two million bucks, hire a certain number of people with a strategy, people who know public relations, people who go up on Capitol Hill. There's nobody opposed to it openly. The Secretary of Defense's are not opposed to it. Nobody in Congress is opposed to it. How do you oppose auditing a budget that size, right? So you start out with a big advantage, don't you? The people who don't want it are Lockheed, Boeing, Raytheon, because they like it the way it is now. I mean, after all, $9 billion was lost in the first year in Iraq by the Pentagon. They couldn't account for it. And the Air Force keeps buying supplies that they have in warehouses around the world that they haven't audited. But even, the, even these defense companies are not willing to come out openly and say defense department budget should not be audited. It's violating federal law, among other things. Well, that's just one example. One example. That's why this book is called It's Easier Than We Think. That's the title, Breaking Through Power. It's easier than we think. History shows it. Contemporary people show it. I have people in, in Washington. Many of them worked with me. We started them with their own groups. I don't believe in a big bureaucracy. Look what they've done. Dr. Sidney Wolf comes to Starts with me, the health research group, gets on the Donnie show. He just came out of the National Institutes of Health at that time. And he and his eight staff have removed from your marketplace hundreds of over-the-counter and prescription drugs that were killing people or cheating people because they weren't effective for the purposes for which they're advertised. One person, few people in his office. Lois Gibbs comes out of Love Canal decades ago. She was a housewife. She was mother of three. It was a housing project. They didn't tell them it was over a deadly toxic waste reservoir, compliments of the departing Hooker Chemical Company, among others. And she raised hell. And she became the leading grassroots organizer with thousands of little groups all over the country operating out of a Washington suburb with a million dollar budget to stop in their tracks toxic leaks and other things that were getting families sick. One woman, Ralph Hotchkiss, 
came out of Oberlin, engineering student. I was in Oberlin speaking uh, one summer, uh, f uh, spring, and I heard a wheelchair coming after me as I was walking out the door. And I turned, and he said, hello, I'm Ralph Hotchkiss. He's a paraplegic and a bicycle accident when he was in high school in Rockford, Illinois. And, I, and he said, can I go work with you this summer? I said, sure. What do you want to do? He says, well, I'm a kind of inventor, and wheelchairs are terribly uh, poorly constructed. They break down. They're not only expensive, but they're controlled by a monopoly company in England, the Jennings Corporation. And I want to break it up. And I want to not patent my inventions. I want to give it free to the VA or anyone else. He goes to Sacramento, uh, San Francisco State. They have a workshop for him. Make a long story short, he revolutionized wheelchair design. He went all over the third world as a paraplegic, teaching poor people how to build sturdy wheelchairs inexpensively from local materials. And they began teaching him different improvements for which he was very open. And you know, in the third world especially, if you don't have a wheelchair, it's a death sentence for many people. And here he is. Anybody know him? You ever see it on TV? We own the public airwaves. <clears throat> Why don't we have our own audience network? Why do we give 24 hours a day to the radio and TV stations who pay us no rent compliments of a supine Congress and FCC, and we should have our own, our own studios all over, reporters, producers. You can't have a democracy without a democratic media. And, and you can, and, and how do we pay for it? Simple, we charge the radio and TV stations rent. We're the landlords, they're the tenants. Look at cable TV, 650 cable stations, one more idiotically trivial after another. We do not have a labor cable channel. We do not have a student cable channel. We don't have a patient cable channel. We don't have a small taxpayer cable channel. We don't have anything. And yet we give a monopoly license. Where's our expectation level? Well, to me, the worse things get, the more motivated I get. And, 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 that's, and, and that's the... And I, I stole that value from the sports world. When they're behind, do they give up? Uh, does the basketball team go to the coach in the third quarter? Halfway through, coach, we're 38 points behind. Why waste the rest of the time? Let's call it a day. All right, so we're near the end here. And <clears throat> there's a lot more in this book. Uh, this is the shortest book I've ever written. I pay attention to short attention spans. <laughs> uh, but it's full of real life examples, real life necessities, real life responses. In fact, when you organize this Congress watchdog group, uh, and you summon your senators and representatives to your own town meetings. The, the formal summons, lawyer-like, whereas Congress is derelict, Congress has surrendered, Congress is this and that. Now, therefore, you are summoned to meet your citizens back home with their agenda, their rules, and their location of public convenience. The summons you can do your own summons, but I wrote it out for you. You can fill in the blanks. Now, I'd really like you to buy this as a six-pack, because I want you to take it to your neighbors or your friends or give it to a grown-up child or whatever. Put it in the library. I'm not bragging about this. There are a lot of good books around, a lot of great documentaries around. We live in a golden age. But very little is happening. These great books that expose terrible situations, read the last two pages. They leave you hanging. Until the people rise up. Well, how? Where? Who is going to focus on the Congress or the state legislature? The Kyber passes. Let me end on, on this note. There is a, 
a grassroots way to start these groups. There is an easy way where some multi-billionaire says, okay, here's 100 million bucks. It costs 100 million bucks to set these up in 435 districts with the organizers, the rehand, you know, the reach out, and the full-time offices to get it underway, kick start it, so to speak. Either way, you will see such a fast change in Congress that it would dispel all your myths of a gridlocked institution. And I'll end with this note. We proved it ourselves in the 60s and 70s. When I went to Washington, having lost a lot of friends in car crashes, and I was determined to get GM and the auto companies regulated, there were no mandatory safety standards, no seat belts, no airbags, no padded dash panels, no head restraints, no decent brakes, tires, so on. I connected with a few people around the country, including insider engineers in the auto companies, doctors dealing with trauma prevention. And I was there. I remember very clearly my first night was in a YMCA, and I ate my last hot dog at the White Tower. And I said to myself, I was 30 years old, I said, how am I going to go about doing it? First, I went up on Capitol Hill to the jurisdictional committees. In those days, if you got the chair of the Senate Commerce Committee, who happened to be Warren Magnuson from the state of Washington, and who was one of the favorite go-to senators for business interests. Within five years, he became the greatest champion of consumer legislation in the Senate in American history because he was fearing the rumble from the people back here, the rumble from the 60s. And he had some good staff, like Jerry Grinstein and Mike Perchuk. Jerry lives here. I then went to the House and Congressman Harris from West Virginia. You convinced those two in those days, because of seniority, they got it through the committee, you get it through the committee, you get it through the Senate, uh, the, the Congress. Well, the president has to sign it. You call up, turns out Lyndon Johnson was expected to run for president again, 1968. He had a chief of staff, Joe Califano, who took an interest in auto safety had great resonance throughout the country. I mean, who wants to get killed in an otherwise preventable crash? And he said he'd go with it. Then I had to get five or six reporters, and I knocked on a lot of doors, and I got a reporter for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Morton Mintz, the reporter for UPI, Pat Sloyan, future Pulitzer Prize winner, Baltimore Sun, AP, and believe it or not, the Wall Street Journal. And then it was off, it was done. Now we're all capable of that. We can do it in your state capital. You can do it in City Hall. Some of you have done it in City Hall. People like Nick Hanauer and others taking the lead on the minimum wage. And when it's done, you say, I didn't think it was that easy. Well, it isn't easy if you just have one person when you need 10, or you have 10 when you need 100. But you almost never need more than that. Less than 1% of the people with public opinion behind them and knowledge and strategy and laser beam focus on the institutions and almost no special interest can stand in the way. Last point. The presidential campaign is nothing more than a mirror of us. We allowed the deterioration every four years we allowed a corporate debate commission to be set up, funded by Anheuser-Busch or Ford Motor Company, controlled by the two parties, and keeping third parties off the stage, the only way they can reach tens of millions of people, even though public opinion polls want more people on that stage, if only to reduce their drowsiness. <laughs> We're the ones... We're the ones who let the two parties run away from us into the hands of Wall Street and the fat cats. We're the ones who were 
perfectly willing to be turned into spectators instead of, to use Jefferson's words, participators. We're the ones who were otherwise preoccupied and couldn't give a few hours a year to our citizen and electoral duties. So, you know, we can talk all we want about Donald Trump. These elections were turned into entertainment years ago. Slogans, silly talk, inadequate questioning by the press, all kinds of major issues off the table. I've kept my, my uh, website open from 2008 just to show you 18 issues that the majority of the people are worried about in this country, some of them they support, that were taken completely off the table for discussion by the Republican Democrat parties. It's votenator.org, still on. So when I hear a lot of questions about the campaigns and what do you think of Hillary Clinton, hawkish Hillary, Hillary of the war, Hillary of the Wall Street, Democratic Party no less, Donald Trump, failed gambling czar, corporate welfare king, cheats almost all his business connections, he cheats his workers, his creditors, his suppliers, his taxpayers, cheats, he's a cheating Donald, very unstable, Everything is taken as a bruised ego. Gets up at three in the morning to attack the weight level of a former Miss Universe. This is out of Captain Quig. It's out of Dr. Strangelove, except that he wants to make peace with Russia and Hillary is waiting to pick a fight with Russia on their western border, which has been invaded twice and killed 45 million Russians. And we're pushing NATO, a military alliance we control, into their western border and wondering why Putin is upset and he wants to use it to suppress dissonance in his country. This is a very dangerous situation. And she's the leader of the pivot to Asia, which is a way of confronting China. Imagine China having a pivot to the Caribbean, confronting China and ensuring another massive arms race, another bloated military budget, Another, no money to repair our schools and public transit and libraries and clinics and sewage and water systems while we blow up the infrastructure of other countries unconstitutionally, illegally, and in violation of international treaties. <laughs> Send a pledge around to your relatives, workers, neighbors to pledge 300 hours or, or so to form this Congress watchdog. Make it a model. You're the software capital of North America. You know how to send it all over the world, all over the country. Make it a model, just like $15 minimum wage in Seattle is being used as a model in other cities around the country. Lead the way, pioneer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have Thank about you. 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. If you have a question, please come up to one of these mics on either side of the stage. Uh, please remember to keep your one question in the form of a question so we can get through as many as possible. Thank you. You sound like Jill Stein. <laughs> She's going to be here October 24th, 7 p.m., University of Washington, Kane Hall, Auditorium Room 130, October 24th, 7 p.m. You're going to have a, a, you know, you're, look, you're a blue state. You don't have to worry. Hillary's going to win. You can vote your conscience. The more third parties like Green Party get votes, the more the pressure on those two parties to shape up in Washington, D.C. Yes. Uh, Mr. Nader, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you. Um, my question 
is do you have any thoughts in regard to the enabled erosion of the Constitution, the rule of law, and regard for ethics in view of the evident insidious political and media-related decline and manufacture of their irrelevance? Very much so. It's a very comprehensive question. You're asking for a seminar, which we don't have time. Uh, the Constitution is being systemically disregarded in explicit areas, like equal protection under the law. Corporations have made the system unequal protection under the law. Uh, as far as corporations goes, that's almost a dead letter in terms of disciplining them. The war declaring power, uh, when was the last time Congress declared war? Uh, Pearl Har after Pearl Harbor. We've had all kinds of wars. Congress can't wait to give it to the presidency. They don't want the responsibility. But those are illegal wars. Those are wars of aggression. They're unconstitutional. Show you the left right on this. Uh, Ed Cato, uh, the head of the Cato Institute, Ed, Ed uh, Crane, for years he was the head of the right wing libertarian Cato Institute in Washington. And when I called him up uh, about the left right, he said, he's kind of a succinct guy, he doesn't waste words. He said, yeah, 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 Ralph, okay. Uh, I oppose all corporate subsidies, unconstitutional wars, Patriot Act, and the Federal Reserve run amok. Well, unconstitutional wars, you see. As far as ethics, uh, whistleblower protection laws, we were early on pioneered whistleblower protection laws in the federal government that government civil servants can blow the whistle on illegal conflict of interest, whatever, ethical, unethical behavior, and get some protection. In fact, they can get a, a percentage of the money that's recovered under the Whistleblower Protection Act 1986, bitterly opposed by corporation, rammed through Congress left, right, with huge majorities. See what I mean? Again, huge majority. Senator Grassley, Republican Iowa, Howard Berman, California, got together. Beat the corporate lobbies. So it's a very important thing. It's interesting that we don't have discussions provoked by this question at law schools, very minimal discussions about law schools. They cannot bear to, to discuss that the presidency has become an outlaw institution. It messes up their myths with these impressionable law students. Yes. So Ralph, uh, my name's Nick. I was a national Bernie Sanders delegate. I witnessed the facade of democracy that was the Democratic National Convention firsthand. It sounds to me like what you're describing with these congressional watch groups are essentially a political party. Like what is the difference in your mind between what you're describing and a powerful alternate political party and what do you think the major blockers are in our system to make of an alternate party viable? Yeah. The problem, I'm all for multi-parties. There are huge ballot access barriers. They harass petitioners on the street. The whoever party feels, major party feels threatened by a, 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 a third party. In this case, the Democratic Party. Here's what they did to us. Um, we were sued 24 times in 12 weeks in the summer of 2004 to get us off the ballot. That drained our resources and time enormous, just imagine. One time we were ordered to be in 15 courtrooms in Pennsylvania. By Monday morning, we got the notice Friday morning. The second thing they do is they have these built-in barriers. Uh, you have to get tons of signatures. And then they go on the streets and they put fake names in so they can accuse you of fraudulent petitioning. There are no, there are no criminal penalties for this. That's just politics. You violate a traffic ordinance, you can get in trouble. You violate systematically the right to give the voters more voices and choices on the ballot. That's just politics. And the third thing that they do is they keep you off the debates. So, while, so you can see how they can stop you for a long time. With the Congress Watch local, they can't stop you because you're working between elections. You're basically pressuring them to change or else in a whole variety of ways. Just a, as a footnote to this, I'm not saying don't do what you're doing. Uh, he created, Bernie created a great aura. He organized a lot of young people. 
The problem is when he folded, as he told us he was going to do, he was going to support Democratic nominee, he said that from day one, he didn't leave his supporters with that much to do, and I'm afraid it may dissipate unless our revolution or brand new Congress efforts that can get some traction. But remember one thing. Uh, the real successful lobbyists in this country do not mess around with marches and demonstrations. Even though I believe in marches and demonstrations, especially at the beginning, you get people active, energized, you find new people. For example, have you ever see, uh, seen on television a massive march in Washington, D.C., down Pennsylvania Avenue, by the military industrial complex? <laughs> demanding more F-35s, more nuclear subs. They are in in personam lobbying, 535. They know who they are, who funds them, who their friends are, who they pay golf with, what their staff is like, their connections to the executive branch, on and on, in personam lobbying. Have you ever seen a mass rally by APAC or the NRA? Hey, more military aid to Israel, crush the Palestinians, or more bazookas, more tanks. We want the right to have laser beam vaporizers. Now, in personam lobbying, files on every one of them. When APAC has a convention in Washington, over 400 members of Congress fall all over themselves to attend. Can you imagine that? They don't mess around with demonstrations. They're very tightly organized back home in the congressional districts. Yes? Our president has a term limit. Are we ever going to get that for the Senate and the House where they have term limits instead of them being there 30 years? We'll get it with the Congress watchdog groups. You can put that on the list. That happens to be a left-right issue. Uh, I, uh, I don't believe in six-year limits. I believe in 12, two Senate and six House. By that time, even the good ones are either worn out or they sell out. The very few, the only one that really lasted beyond that was Henry Waxman from California and Ed Markey from Massachusetts. Uh, but most of them wear out or they sell out after 12 years. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned huge issues and great thinkers like Cicero. Um, and I think we all remember them for one quote or one big idea. And I believe everybody in this room probably will agree that you will be remembered for something like that in 100 or in 2,000 years. What do you want us to go home remembering about you or about your writing? I want you to go home saying, I I'm going to make a difference, and I'm going to spend time, talent, skill, and knowledge to make a difference. And, and, I'd like, and I'd like you to make a difference in justice and not charity. Although charity, charity is very much needed, you know, when you're hungry, down and out, good food, soup kitchen, it's good to have. We can't underestimate that. But a society that has more justice is a society that needs less charity. Yeah. So you, um, you have an anti-nuclear position? Uh, I was, oh, sorry. You have an anti-nuclear position? I was curious what specific aspects of nuclear reactors you have problems with, and if you've reassessed those with the newer designs of nuclear reactors that largely don't have these problems in general. Like and where? The, like the liquid fluoride uh, oh, yeah. thorium so reactor. The, the case against nuclear power is totally overwhelming. Uh, first of all, it's unnecessary. We waste huge amounts of electricity uh, and a, uh, a megawatt of nuclear electricity that is uh, saved by efficiency is one you don't have to build. So like a gallon of gasoline, that you don't need because you have more fuel efficient cars is a gallon of gasoline you don't have to refine. It's, a, it's to be very precise about it in summary, nuclear power is unsafe, unnecessary, uninsurable, cannot be privately financed by Wall Street 
for new construction with a 100% government tax guarantee. Unevacuable, you imagine Indian Point, 30 miles from Manhattan on the Hudson River, you're gonna evacuate, they can't even get out of town on rush hour. They're gonna evacuate, and they've never had an evacuation drill around any of the 100 or so nuclear plants in the country because they know they can't make it work. They know it'd be a disaster. In fact, the Shoreham nuclear plant was built with $7 billion years ago in Long Island, and they finally conceded a report by a consultant that it was impossible to evacuate that area in case of a coming meltdown uh, around the plant, 10 miles, and they never opened the plant, and they forced the taxpayer to pay, the ratepayer to pay for it over years, the Long Island Lighting Company. And the other thing is, is, is even worse, it's a sit and duck for a terror attack. F fuel rods in water all over, next to these plants. They have not solved the radioactive waste problem for 200,000 years or so. It is a horrendously brutal, cruel, insane, inefficient way to boil water. That's all it's there for, to boil water to produce steam, to turn the turbines, to give you electricity. We don't have better ways to boil water. How about using the sun? It's going to be around for four billion years. Uh, yeah. So we have time left just for the folks that are in line at the moment. Okay. Yes. Oh, I think he's next. Oh, okay. So. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hello, sir. I was curious how you feel about the interpretation of the um, Article 5 of the Constitution that uh, says that an, um, a convention of the states is able to propose and ratify an amendment because there's currently a movement uh, for state legislatures to um, make an amendment to get money out of politics. And I'm curious of your opinion about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, pu Public Citizen is in the lead, a group I started. They're going to try to get as many members of Congress and do it that way, first Congress, then the states. Uh, they think it's a little less onerous, but there's a better way to get around Citizens United. Uh, almost every major corporation does business with the U.S. government. All the U.S. government has to do through an executive order is to stipulate that they don't want any contractors uh, to get a contract with the U.S. government and be able to put money in the coffers of senators and representatives uh, to tilt the system and corrupt the system. Customer is always right. That's part of the procurement. If you want to contract for military or forest services or medical services with U.S. government, uh, you cannot use the license provided by the Supreme Court decision 5-4 called Citizens United and give from your corporation directly money to oppose or, propose or support a candidate. Simple. That's what it's gotta be done. Much easier, doesn't cover everyone, small business or something, people who don't do business with the government. But do you know many corporations who don't do business with the US government? Very, very, very few. Every one of the 500 top corporations do business with the U.S. government. Uh, hello, thank you for your talk this evening. I apologize if my question's naive. I've only recently uh, became acquainted with your with your work, but um, can you get a little closer, please? Yes, I'm. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on um, money in initiative campaigns, and um, if you think it's a problem, particularly outside money uh, in, local elect in local ballot measures, and uh, if you have any ideas on how to address it. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's one of the problems. You know, people fight a century ago in California and elsewhere to put the initiative referendum recall on the ballot. That's direct democracy, where if the legislatures are in the pockets of special interests and don't act, uh, the people who can petition, put the law on the ballot, and vote it in, or repeal a law, or recall a legislator. That's the initiative referendum recall. We did that in 1988, when the legislature in California would not reform uh, the auto insurance industry. And they were hiking the rates and 
you know, redlining people from being covered. And we spent two million bucks, the insurance company spent 70 million bucks, and we beat them. However, a lot of times you can't beat them. They spend too much money. Tobacco industry, oil industry, the GMO, Monsanto battles. So again, campaign finance reform should apply to initiatives as well as candidates running for office. And the best way to do that is a check off on the tax return, a substantial one, say up to $300 on the, and if you don't want to give, you don't have to give. But if you do, it goes to a trust fund. It's allocated according to ballot qualified candidates. And they get a certain amount of free time on our property, free time on radio and TV, which is what takes most of the money that candidates raise. And that should apply to initiatives as well. Sir, you speak a lot about domestic corporate corruption, but as our world has become more globalized and interconnected, it could be argued that global corporate corruption might be a bigger focus in this next century. How would you suggest regulating global corporate corruption? What systems should be put in place, and how would they be held accountable? Okay, there's a foreign corrupt uh, uh, law in the U.S. That, that has an arm abroad. So if a, a foreign company tries to corrupt our officials, they can uh, be prosecuted. And that has happened. It's called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, a lot of corporate lawyers wring their hands over how they're going to try to weaken it or repeal it. Another is international treaties. For example, we can have an international uh, drug medicine treaty, not hard drug, uh, in which the treaty can begin curbing uh, monopolistic practices, cartel practices, which are criminal offenses under some countries' antitrust laws. The third way is you give, you develop international tribunals where people can sue these companies. We started the first law museum in the world last September in my hometown in Connecticut called the American Museum of Tort Law that Margaret was there. And, uh, and I was astonished to learn it was the only law museum in the world. What's wrong with the legal profession, for heaven's sake? <laughs> and there's a museum on almost every conceivable thing. I mean, uh, almost laughable in terms of the, the subjects of these museums. But the point was to educate people that lawsuits are good for society. Uh, bad lawsuits are often thrown out. The judges control the courtroom. They don't spend their lunches reading Karl Marx, you know, they're mostly conservative. And we've got to get people to be given civil rights of action internationally in these tribunals. So if you're being poisoned by some foreign chemical company and they make sure they don't have much in this country to be sued, you can sue them in Germany or you can sue them in Taiwan or wherever. So there's a lot of work to be done. But after all, all the people in the world they want safety too, they want health too, they want this kind of mutuality. And this country has worked overtime to be a military superpower. When are we gonna start becoming a humanitarian or a justice superpower, you see? That's up to us. Uh, Mr. Nader, uh, I would like to know your thoughts on the uh Gentrification that's been kind of sweeping through the. Can you get closer, uh, please? Gentrification that's been sweeping through the inner cities and the major U.S. cities throughout uh, the United States right now is occurring and uh, basically uh, causing uh, people to be displaced because of high rents and high. Uh, I, I'm not getting it. Can you start over again? Go ahead. I want to know your thoughts on gentrification and how it's been sweeping you know, across. Gentrification. The, yes. Okay, yeah and how it's been sweeping across the inner cities and uh, displacing folks because of the high cost of uh, rent and whatnot. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's a horrible problem in Washington, D.C., uh, gentrification. Most of the new construction, high-priced condominiums, you know, that's true in other cities. The usual approach is they require, when they build the condominiums, they require investment in additional affordable housing. But the real estate developers resist that. Sometimes it works here and there, but the idea is if you're going to build condos and replace X acreage, you've got an obligation to put in 
more affordable housing. That's a very piecemeal approach. Another approach is zoning, where you have stricter uh, zoning situations. Uh, it gets to be very complex. And for example, African Americans being pushed out of Washington, D.C. to Prince George's County. And increasingly, you can't afford to live there, like you can't afford to live in San Francisco, or you can't afford to live in Vancouver, BC, or Seattle, or wherever. Uh, the other thing is rent control. And you gotta do it in a smart way. There is rent control for ma some major cities, but the minute someone leaves, then they jack it up, and it, it's out of the rent control pool, and after a while, it's not as effective. The final way is cooperative housing. For the life of me, I don't know why our country has not pushed cooperative housing. It's huge in Germany and Scandinavia. And th that is a way to level the playing field against gentrification. Uh, because when you're in cooperative housing, you're not gonna have the speculative binges uh, and pressures of a corporation owning a, a, an apartment building. Now, we, we, years ago, 1978, under Carter, we got a law through called the National Consumer Cooperative Bank. And its principal funding has been for co-op housing. And most people don't even know about it, and it's too small to begin with. But cooperative housing, go to the national, it's not, they dropped the word consumer. So now it's National Cooperative Bank. They have a low-income development unit where they're supposed to have specialists addressing your kind of concern, affordable housing. So just go to, you know, connect with them. Tell them I told you to call them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mr. Nader, it is an honor to be here in front of you today. I am a whistleblower. I need help. Fourteen and a half years ago, six months after 9-11, I was assaulted for speaking up against 18-year-old kids that were being put in asbestos on a daily basis in our Seattle City Swedish hospital. I have gone to many People, I have voiced this story thousands of times to mostly mute ears. After the assault, I contacted OSHA. OSHA found everything I said to be true, but because there were no witnesses in the room, I was left to fend for myself. I became homeless. It took me years to qualify for federal Social Security. I got it. Fourteen and a half years later, when I talk about this story, I'm still traumatized by it. Did you say st people are exposed to asbestos? Yeah. In a, in a hospital? Yeah. Pretty deadly. <clears throat> I've been trying to get this story out. Again, to mute ears, I've gone to the media. Um, I, j I don't have the strength to do it on my own. Is it still going on? In this particular building, probably not. But the company that was doing this work was a part of a corporation that was in 25, 30, 40 other cities. Just recently, I found out that they filed for chapter bankruptcy 11 um, a couple of years after I did what I did because I think they knew it was about to boil over. I don't know what happened to the men that did what they did to me, but it was in construction. This well, happened know, 30 you know, feet from the main let me, entrance. Let me interrupt you a minute. Yes. Uh, a lot of these asbestos companies use the a bankruptcy option because they're being sued. 
you know, hundreds of thousands of suits. Asbestos, by the way, has taken over 400,000 American lives, ship, shipyard workers, and workers, pipe fitters, and so on. And the asbestos companies knew about it and didn't engage in the proper protective clothing like hazmat or alert the medical profession of their findings, the company doctor. So it's not surprising they went bankrupt. But have, do you ever go to the Government Accountability Project, GAP, in Washington? I've not heard of them. Well, I've contacted OSHA, but yeah. again, like I say, yeah. that's the department that's supposed to help me. And they dropped the ball. They wrote me off. Well, I have my paperwork. I, filed a, I was forced to file my own lawsuit, which at the time, two federal laws were broken. Um, they found everything in this lawsuit to be 100% accurate. But because I was forced to go to trial with this law, they had had this one wrapped up in appeals, so I couldn't bring the word asbestos into this. I was basically up against a Harvard-less lawyer and made to look like scum. And of course, well, I Well, listen, let me suggest, by the way, whistleblowers who take their conscience to work catch hell like you cannot believe. We try to develop a law where they get a bounty uh, for reporting, say, fraud. This wasn't so fraud. This was a, a serious hazard. Uh, where they get a bounty of the recovery, like they blow the whistle on a hospital chain ripping off Medicare. And the hospital chain is adjudicated by the Justice Department's efforts, and they have to pay back, say, 20, 50 million bucks. Uh, the, the whistleblower can get as much as 20, 25 percent. It's not easy, but at least they got something to live on when they're ostracized and put on a blacklist. And nobody really appreciates what it's like when you blow the whistle on a big organization, even a university or a labor union, not to mention the oil company or nuclear company or the Pentagon. These are some of the most heroic people of all. And their lives are often ruined. And one thing goes after another. Family stresses, family breakup, can't meet the bills, have to leave the home, uh, and so on. So I'm glad you shared your story, but go to the Government Accountability Project, GAP, ask for Tom Devine. He's been at defending whistleblowers against OSHA and the Pentagon for years. Nobody knows more about it. And tell him that I asked that you contact him. Thank you. And just a couple concluding words, because we, ha we have to all conclude. Number one, if you want to go through, see all the agendas that we talked about, you know, for Congress Watchdog, go to breakingthroughpower.org. Those are 64 hours that we had in constitutional law in the Carnegie Institution, four in late May, four in late September. It's all on video. And you can see what I mean by Experts coming, these are the civic leaders of our country who came. The mass media blacked it out, but we don't have our own democratic media. But it gives you great detail, and it connects you with the brain trust. These are experts. You want to do public banking? Got Ellen Brown out of Berkeley. Nobody knows more than her. You want to do energy? S. David Freeman. One of the things he did was run SCUD, and he closed down the nuclear plant. He ran the Tennessee Valley Authority. Want to deal with food, nutrition, et cetera, Michael Jacobson, pensions, Karen Ferguson. They're, they're all in online. We have booklets for people who still believe in print. Last thing, if you want to stay in touch, you want to get free electronically my weekly column, just go to nader.org, sign up, and you get my column every week, seven minutes of agitation. And, and what to do about it. And so we end with that great Ming Dynasty philosopher, to know and not to do is not to know. Let's go to work. Thank you. <laughs>